Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnold, and thanks to the others in the organizing team who are here today, and thanks to my colleague Yonglei, who will be co-piloting this. Uh, so my name is Tor Wickfeld. I lead the Swedish node of the EuroCC network, ENCCS, and I would like to take five minutes to tell you a little bit about what we do in ENCCS before handing over the word to, to Yonglei to show you uh, how you can program GPUs using Python. So if you go to enccs.se, uh, you find our website. And I just want to walk you through a few things so you know what, who we are, what we do, and how we can help you, potentially. So basically, we can help you get supercomputer access and training for free. And by supercomputer access, we actually mean via the Euro HPC uh, ecosystem. So Berzelius, uh, at Lean Shopping, you apply via the national uh, route um, super and so on. But we are connected with the Euro HPC ecosystem. We are a European project. So if you're interested in more compute than you currently have access to, we can help you with that. With that. You can find us on social media, uh, LinkedIn or uh, X slash Twitter, LinkedIn. We have a YouTube channel with recordings from many previous training events. And we have a newsletter that comes out roughly bi-monthly with all kinds of interesting, useful in information about HPC. Yeah, so what do, uh, what are we, what do we do? As I told you, we're a national competence center in high performance computing, HPC. We target industry, public sector, public administration, as well as academia. The focus is on supercomputing access and training, but we also, in some cases, work on pilot projects, proof of concept projects, helping in particular companies, but it, it can be other actors too. Uh, somehow leverage HPC to improve their R&D uh, activities. Um, on our website, you can find news, tutorials, a list of people we have worked with, organizations, and so on. You can explore that at your own uh, pace later. I just want to tell you about here, uh, we have upcoming events, which might be very interesting, several ones uh, relating to machine learning. You can see that here uh, somewhere. Well, GPU programming bootcamp together with NVIDIA, multi GPU bootcamp, and then AI for science bootcamp in, in June. We also have, if you go here, uh, a lesson library. So these are training materials from earlier training events that we have organized either by ourselves or in collaboration with various uh, collaborators, other organizations. And as a policy, we we um, publish our training material open source, and it's not usually in the in the format of of only slides, but it's some sort of interactive uh, material that you can uh, with exercises and and written text. Let me maybe just scroll down to something here. If we look at Python, because you will be hearing about Python today, many of our lessons training materials look something like this. So you can go here to. Is browse the, the contents here and, and you see that it's sort of quite accessible also for self-learning. So the, these resources are for you to have a look at. You can reuse the material in your own training as well. The, the license is uh, permissive. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about um, ENCCS. Uh, maybe feel free in this HackMD document. Now it's not here for me, but uh, Arnold, shared it with you in the chat. No, it's not this one, sorry. This one, this one. Write any questions here at the very bottom of, of this uh, HackMD document. How do you do it? You go to the top and you click the edit button here. And then you scroll down and you can ask your question here at the end. Question, and we will make sure to answer. So that's it from me for now. Now over to Young Lee, and I will come back later to tell you a little bit about Julia. Yes, it is me. I will talk about the uh, first time. Uh, yes, it's here. here. Uh, I can mention that uh, at the HackMD document, we share the links. It is here, links for this document. You can download the Drupal notebook. Uh, the, for today's presentation, and also there are other lessons and uh, also our GitHub repositories. 
yes, we talk about the GPU programming, but before that, we will we will talk a little bit what is GPU. So GPU, it is a graphic processing unit. It's similar to uh, the central processing unit that is the CPU in our computer. The GPU is a specialized electronic unit. At the beginning, it is developed for image processing and the computer graphics, but now it is devolved to a powerful general purpose accelerator for this massive parallel computing. Here, I show a simple comparison. The left one is Intel i7, and in the, mid, uh, the, the middle one is NVIDIA 800, the powerful GPU. The right one is AMD Mi 250. From outside, it's difficult to figure out what's the difference. But if you see the internal architecture, you can figure out the, the, the difference. A common thing is that both of them have uh, internal uh, several uh, internal components, including ARU, which arithmetic logic unit, that's the cores, and the memories at different levels, and also the control unit. Uh, the difference is that uh, CPU is somewhat quite complex, and uh, they have a large areas devoted to control unit and the memories. But for the GPU, it's very somewhat simple. You can see that it can compact lots of uh, hundreds of thousands of cores in a single chip, so as to achieve a uh, high compute density. So in addition to this, uh, uh, I can also say that uh, at currently, GPU is not uh, uh, right here. It's not a standalone platform, but a coprocessor to CPU. That's uh, therefore in most of the cases, CPU refers to the host and the GPU refers to the device. In addition to this, to these internal architectures, they have different functions. GPUs, uh, CPU is much powerful and uh, dedicated to uh, oh, a powerful control unit. They can rapidly switch between different instructions. So GPU is devoted to data catching and the uh, flow control. While well, GPU cores are less powerful and uh, well, sometimes have less memory, but they are powerful in parallel processing of simple and repeating instructions through a thousand hundreds of cores. That is, in most, in most cases, GPU are devoted to data processing or parallel data processing. Yeah, uh, with GPU, we have lots of platforms always comes together with software, software stack and the APIs. Um, currently, uh, three major companies, NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel, have their own, they can design and produce GPUs. They can provide their own APIs. Uh, APIs is short for application programming interface. So there we have CUDA for NVIDIA GPU, ROC for uh, AMD GPU, and one API for the Intel GPU. Well, these APIs can provide a standard way for software or software developers to interact with the GPU hardware so as to achieve a better performance and the profitability of the GPU code. Besides these uh, platform specific APIs, some, some others, for example, Direct Compute, OpenCL, and SQL, uh, you can check the advantages and also the application areas. Because of their superpowers, we can see that here is a list of top 10 HPC in the world. Nine of them are equipped with uh, GPUs. The, red, uh, the green is for the NVIDIA GPU, the red for the AMD GPU, and the blue for the Intel GPU. Yeah, it's, uh, it's widely used in different areas. Yeah, we know what is GPU. Let's talk about the GPU programming. As I said before, GPU is not a standalone platform, as but a coprocessor to CPU. Therefore, GPU programming does not mean, does not mean that it will replace CPU with GPU for pro programming, but as each one has its own advantages at certain programs. Therefore, GPU programming means we combine both CPU and the GPU together, and the CPU is responsible for the control intensive tasks and the CPU will be responsible for the data parallel or computation intensive tasks with simple control. So as such, we can, uh, GPU programming is very suited for the programs with a large amount of data parallelism. Uh, yeah, specifically speaking, we can expect a good performance of GPU programming 
and the following areas, for example, graphic rendering and computer games, because these are the original use case of GPU. Uh, large scale matrix and uh, Fourier transformation, convolutional neural network. Uh, this is quite common in machine learning, scientific computing, and the image processing. Yeah, there are some others about molecular dynamics simulations, Monte Carlo simulation, and the computing fluid dynamics. Um, also, uh, GPU programming are widely used across finance, social, natural science, and other fields if they need uh, to simulate quite a complex physical systems. Uh, in addition to this, uh, cloud and uh, quantum computing areas, the GPU programming is very uh, promising for these applications. Yeah, before we go going to talk about details, we should mention something about uh, GPU programming models. Uh, we know that uh, uh, currently there are several ways to use the GPU for programming. Uh, representative, three representative ones are right here. Directive-based programming models, non-portable and portable kernel-based models. All these three models are based are developed based on the assumption that you can write code using C, C++, and Fortran to write the source code. As such, these programming models can help you to improve the performance and the profitability of your code. Therefore, these programming uh, models are somewhat at kind of low level. Uh, this is not the topic of this webinar. What we're going to talk is about the high level language programming frameworks and libraries. That is Python and Julia. Uh, in my part, I'm mean, talking about the G programming using Python and my colleague Tor will talk about that using Julia. And uh, this one, short introduction to G programming. Let's jump to this Python part. Yep, we're here. Um, for the Python part, Python uh, is a high level general purpose programming language. I think for all the registrations attending this webinar, I hope that you uh, know the basics of uh, Python. So I'm not to talk about the introduction to Python. Uh, in addition, there are three powerful packages uh, developed based on Python that is NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. NumPy and Pandas are used for data analysis, and the Matplotlib are used for data visualization. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but I prepared some uh, code examples. And if you like, you can download this Jupyter notebook and place it code yourself later after this webinar. So, GPU programming using Python. Uh, uh, now we have a lot of progress. If we say uh, compared to 10 years ago about the GPU programming using Python, uh, there are several options working with Python using. Uh, working with uh, GPU programming using Python. I listed the two examples right here. The first one is the workshop we organized last June uh, to, uh, it's a workshop. It contains GPU programming at various levels, uh, low levels, high levels, and also at a different aspect of GPU programming. Uh, you can come to the GitHub report to see what we have done. And right here, I'm going to talk four Examples, a uh, full method to use Python for the uh, GPU programming. First one is CuPy. Second, the CUDF, CUML in the libraries in the Rapids. The third one is PyCuda, and the last one is Number. So, CuPy. CuPy is a GPU version of NumPy and SciPy. It has a very high compatible if interface with NumPy and also SciPy. Uh, originally, it was developed by NVIDIA GPU, but the experiment can support both NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. So if you are familiar with NumPy and SciPy, you can just replace uh, NumPy with CuPy, or just replace the SciPy with CuPy X dot SciPy in your Python code. I provide a short example to see how it works. Uh, yeah, uh, we generate arrays, uh, NumPy array and the CuPy array from a list, and then calculate the Euclidean form no, uh, for norm distribution from the using the linear algebra module in these two packages. And uh, you can see, uh, I think I can run it. Yes. If it takes well, um, you can get exactly the same result. But if you see the uh, the efficiency, we can get the different. Oh, how come it takes? 
Yeah, which uh, we can uh, go. Yeah, you can see we can get exactly the same results. But uh, for the efficiency, uh, they show distinct uh, efficiencies. This is the second example. We generate, we use both NumPy and CoolPy to generate uh, a matrix. Uh, the metric size is 10,000 by 10,000, and uh, we timer this, uh, there, this two uh, parts. And uh, uh, you can see that this is the result I, I get from, uh, I got yesterday about the, the efficiency. Um, that's the guy, we can get that the GPU outperform the CPU at least the hundreds of, uh, uh, efficiency uh, much more faster than the CPU. Uh, third example is the interfacing with the kernels. Supposing that you can write the triple uh, programming code using CUDA C or even Fortran, then you can use CuPy to to call these functions because um, C and the Fortran are somewhat at a low level and that they are if it, they are much more faster even than the Python. Therefore, you can uh, call this uh, function from uh, CoolPy. At first, we define a function um, to for uh, two digit matrix addition, and then generate two matrices x one, x two is the same. Here is uh, here is what is x two is uh, really straightforward, and then we passing all uh, this information. Uh, I'll generate a uh, y matrix with all zeros. Then we pass into information, uh, information for grid, block. These are basic information if we want to use the GPU for the programming. And also the argument, uh, two matrices, uh, three matrices, two input and one output. Then you can get the results. See, this is the very simple uh, matrix addition. This is CoolPy, it's very straightforward and it's much powerful than NumPy. Yeah, we come to the second one is the rapid. Uh, rapid is a high level package uh, collections which implement CUDA functions and APIs with Python bindings. Uh, there are several, uh, it's only support the NVIDIA GPU right now. Uh, there are featured libraries, as you can see, the first is uh, CUDF, uh, CUDF, and now separate is QML. We'll see their details. Uh, so. CUDF is the data frame library for manipulating tabular data set using GPU. If you're familiar with uh, pandas, you will know that the here DF is short for the data frame. Therefore, uh, CUDF is the GPU version of data frame module in pandas. Uh, likewise, this CUML is the GPU version of Stacked Learn API. Uh, yeah, here I'm not to talk too much about the CUDF and the CUML. You can come to the website to, to see the details about how to use these two libraries if you're going to use Rapace. Third one, PyCuda is um uh, well, PyCuda is a Python program environment for uh for CUDA. Uh, it allows user uh developers and also user to access to CUDA API from the Python part. Um. Uh, PyCuda is also available, uh, only available for NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, so if you want to use PyCuda, you should know some, uh, have some experience about the GPU programming. I will, I will show two code examples to see how it works. Before you use CUDA, you should, uh, PyCuda, you should initialize, uh, import it and uh, do some initialization. I can roll it, yeah. And the second step, you should transfer data from, uh, prepare this data at the CPU part and then transfer uh, this data from CPU to GPU. Here we generate uh, a matrix, a size of the four by four uh, with the numbers. The number, the type is double precision, but for some CPUs, they only support the single precision. So we have to make a conversion from double precision to single precision. We get this. And uh, then we allocate the memories on the GPU part and then do the data transfer. H to D means from host to device. That means from CPU to GPU. Once the CPU get uh, the date, we can execute the kernel on the GPU part. Here, the first step, we define the kernel function. To keep it simple, we uh, each number in this matrix will be doubled. And so uh, once we define this uh, this kernel, 
we can compare this kernel, loading it on the GPU, and then call this kernel. Having this information, this is for the grid, the block, and also the metrics. And do this calculation. And after this calculation, we can transfer data from GPU to CPU. Here it's the same. D to H means the, from the device to the host. And then we print this uh, uh, out the, uh, uh, this result. This is the original matrix. This is the output from the G programming is that each number is doubled. Uh, you can see that we wrote a lot of code, but we can also keep it somewhat simple if we use some modules in PyCuda. Here is an example we use PyCuda as the GPU array in PyCuda, and so that we can achieve the same effect but with less writing. Yes, this generates the metrics, uh, data type, conversion, transfer to GPU, calculation, and get back. See, two lines, we can achieve the same effect. Yeah, this is uh, the PyCuda. If you use the PyCuda, you should know something about uh, GPU programming for the CUDA, CUDA C, and also the CUDA Fortune. Um, but if you don't know about this, is it also okay? You can try to use number. So number is an open source just in time compiler. It offer options. Let me see. Yes. Yeah. It offers options for paralyzing Python code for CPU and GPU with minor changes in your code. So uh number provides several utilities for code generation, and its central one is number.jit decorator. Here, I wish, uh, before I run the number, I will stop the kernel, shut down this kernel for a while because it conflicts with the PyCuda programming environment. And then I will let it run again using Python 3. Yes, I design in the first one, I define uh, two functions, which means go slow. I did not use uh, JIT to see, okay, we get this result is 100 microsecond. And the second, we use JIT uh, to see, to perform the same calculation to see the results. It take for a while. Yeah, 2.93 is at least several times much more faster than, uh, than the one without using JIT. This is the first one. Another feature is uh, NumPy can generate NumPy universal functions. There are two types of universal functions. The one is universal functions in the U func. They are operating on scalars. And they are achieved using this vectorized decorator. The second is generalized universal functions. You can operate on high dimensional arrays and also scalars. Um, here only show the first one. I define three functions. CPU, this one without, without using number and running on CPU. The second, the third one to run uh, on the CPU, the target the CPU, target the screwed up, and uh, using number. We see their uh, efficiencies. Yes, generally take. Take time for a while. Uh, this is the time it. This is the magic method. Uh, for you to record to timer to time the uh the um, how long it takes for the for the block during the running. You can see six second, and uh, this is um, three hundred millisecond. At least um, uh eighteen times faster. Well, uh, for the one using GPU, it's somewhat three hundred sixty. Well, some acceptable. At least it's more faster than the one. Well, using CPU with the number, but uh, you should know that uh, using a function is quite easy uh, because uh, it requires minimal understanding of this uh, GPU programming code. Uh, here is example that you did not see the data transfer from CPU to GPU and from CPU to GPU. You did not see the memory allocation at the GPU part, you did not, even did not see how to launch kernels. Well, it's, it's very straightforward, but uh, you, sh uh, you should note that UFUNC and the FUNC for uh, GPU programming, 
may not always yield the optimal performance because Namba can automatically handle the data transfer and kernel launching. So uh, in practical applications, not every function can be conducted use U fun. So it should, uh, uh, it should um, also know some basics about uh, GPU programming or is, is how to construct the kernels. Um, to get a better performance, we need to calibrate the kernels and then manage, manage the data transfer. I here provide an uh, example to see how if we manually manage the data transfer between CPU and the GPU, what we can get. But uh, this example take time, so I just show the result I got yesterday. Yes, I defined a, a function using CUDA.g and uh, generate the functions. And here is the transfer of the data matrix uh, to CUDA, to the device. And uh, yeah, generate the empty one. You terminate this function to see how long it takes to run this uh, command. Print this, uh, this the CPU uh, copy to the host. Of, uh, means the copy the uh, data from the GPU to CPU and the timer. This is the 6.3 milliseconds. And also, if you use the GPU, the number of thread blocks and passing this information to run this, uh, to launch this kernel and then the timer it. Um, I can say somewhat it's uh, uh, something because there are something different if we handle this. Uh, uh, data uh, from and uh, to, uh, from CPU to GPU and also get back, uh, and also the the kernels are uh, somewhat you should uh, improve because this is quite a simple one. It's, it cannot uh, get too much benefit if you use GPU programming. Yep, this is the main part of for GPU programming and also the GPU programming using Python. I will give the. Uh, the left part about uh, GPU programming using Julia to my colleague talk. Yep. Yes. Thanks, Yongle. So, quick question to you: Which NVIDIA were? Uh, sorry, which GPU were you running on? This one. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, quite old GPU is uh, is one thousand thirty. It's produced uh, six or seven years ago. I see. Okay. Yeah. It's still, you got a uh, a significant speed up from some yeah. of your. I, do, I, I don't have a one hundred. Marsilius has A100. Yeah, MVP. next time we can try to use it. Yeah, and there's a huge difference in compute capacity there. Definitely. So I will be showing you now an example, a few examples using Julia, the Julia language. And uh, there I will actually be running it on my own laptop. So I'm not com connecting to a supercomputer. I'm going to run some examples on my own laptop. Uh, but before I start, I think Arnold wants to run a poll, yeah? Yes, I'll launch it now. We can run poll. So how much experience do you have with Julia? Let's give it a few seconds, yeah? Yep, interesting. This is expected, yeah. So three quarters of you don't have prior experience with Julia, and that's absolutely fine. This, my presentation now is only to give you a rough hint, a rough overview of how things actually look when you program in Julia and when you run uh, to program GPUs in Julia. So let me share my screen. Can you share, see it well? So this is the third Jupyter Notebook that you can find in that uh, GitHub repository that we shared with you. It's both linked in the HackMD document, but also <clears throat> in the in the chat, Zoom, Zoom chat. So this is, uh, I obviously have far too little time to cover anything in any detail. It's gonna be a very fast overview. I'm not even gonna cover all of this material. 
but the idea is that you can have a look at this material after the webinar and um, you know learn by yourself we have already three individual training materials lessons uh, based on julia one is an introduction uh, then we have julia for high performance data analytics and machine learning and one for high performance computing so you can find further details there so what is julia it's it's a programming language it's free and open source it it bridges high level interpreted languages something like python that we just saw also r Mat matlab and low level compiled languages like the ones uh, yongle mentioned c c++ fortran and it offers high performance which is actually comparable to c and fortran without sacrificing the simplicity and the productivity in the higher level languages and that's why it was how it was designed that's why it was designed created it's uh, it it's, it tries to solve the two language problem what is that? It's when you are working on your project, you research, you write some prototype code in, in high level language, Python, R, MATLAB, and it looks good. Everything is working, but it's just too slow, right? You, now you have to produce results and it's running far too slowly. What do you do? Well, now we saw what that you can actually run on a GPU using Python, but sometimes people actually interface. <clears throat> they rewrite some parts of the code in, in a low level language and somehow interface to that. Julia is designed to uh, overcome this, this problem. And it's technically it's based on just in time compilation. I will, uh, I will come back to that. So it's, it feels like an interpreted language and it mostly behaves like an interpreted language like Python, but it actually, what happens when you execute code is that it compiles the code just in time. So, as you hit enter, as you run the code, it, it compiles it. Just to show you that Julia is actually fast, here's a, you might not see all the text here, but C is the reference. Everything is re relative to the performance of the C programming language. And all these different dots here are different micro benchmarks, you know, something like matrix multiplication and so on. And Julia is really, really close to C compared to here we have MATLAB, Mathematica, Python, R. They are really orders of magnitude slower. Okay, so I will not be able to do Julia any justice. So I will not be able to tell you much about the syntax. It's not super exotic. I mean, you can define floating point numbers and integers and so on. Vectors and arrays look similar to Python. This is a list and array. You can also have these types of array comprehensions like in, in Python. Uh, when you want to operate uh, element by element, you use a broadcasting operation with a dot. So here you you raise el every element of, of A1 to the power of two, and you put it into a new uh, array, B1. Loops, conditionals, so for loops, similar to Fortran, uh, sorry, similar to Python, except you don't, you don't actually need indentation like in Python. Instead of, of indentation, you have for like an end statement always. You can loop over uh, matrices efficiently, like so. You can loop over dictionaries. Julia has dictionaries. You can if, else, else if, else end statements, while loops, and so on. Working with files, not too different from Python. If you know the width, statement, uh, the context manager in, in Python, uh, this accomplishes the same thing, open some file, do f, and here we can write to a file and then we can read from the file later. So I will dwell a little bit on functions because functions are super important in Julia. Julia differs from Python and many other languages in the sense that it's not an object oriented language. You don't write classes uh, in, in Julia, instead, you actually structure the code around functions and methods of the functions. And exactly what that means, I will come back to. So here's one way to uh, generate a very simple function, x plus y. Uh, you can pass, you can have keyword arguments after a semicolon, and you can have uh, optional arguments like so. Okay, so far we have not seen any specification of types. Uh, in Python, you don't need to put any types, you can say x equal to one, you don't have to tell Python that it's supposed to be an integer. And it's the same thing in, in Julia, you don't have to specify the types. And why don't you have to specify it? It's because 
the Julia compiler infers all the types at runtime. It figures out what all the types are, and it actually generates very fast code based on those inferred types. But sometimes you want to be specific. You want to tell the Julia compiler, just, just in time compiler, that this function actually accepts only floating point numbers, double precision. And this leads us to a short discussion about types. We really don't need to talk much about types uh, or um, write much types in our Julia code because Julia figures it out. But under the hood, there's a very sophisticated, complex type system in Julia. And that's indeed where most of the power of Julia comes from. And I will come back now to um, functions and tell you about multiple dispatch. Let's say we have a function sum square, which just sums the square of two numbers. What does the output show us? It's a ge generic function with one method. Sometimes we might want to define additional methods of the same function, which do something different for different types. Now, this is not doing anything different. It's just doing the same thing. But just to show you here that now sum square is a generic function with four individual methods. And multiple dispatch is when you run Julia code, the Julia <clears throat> compiler figures out all the, the types of all the variables, and it finds the method of all the functions that is most specific for the types that it figured out. And it runs, it compiles that method to efficient machine code and executes it. And just to show you how that might potentially be interesting, so you can uh, define uh, power, uh, what is it called now? Um, composite types or a struct. You might want to work with points in two dimensions, for example. Here's a, a composite type, which where the, we have a furthermore a parametric dependence here. So all the the two float the two numbers that is that are included in a point data type should be have a type which is a subtype of of the real, so some sort of number. Let's say this is useful for our code to have points. And let's say we want to now be able to take the sum of squares of point data types. We can then specify here that point data types go in. And we have to tell Julia how to actually square and sum up two points. This is not a unique way to do it. But let's say this is, for some different reasons, the, the way we want it to work. So now we have. Um, added yet another function uh, method to the function, and we can work with this derived data type, this composite type. I will not talk about code generation. I talk, I mentioned the, the compiler and so on. This is, it's done in multiple steps. If you're interested in that, you can have a look. I'm also not gonna talk about this, except to tell you that these at uh, keywords, these are macros that do something special. And these particular macros here, they, they show us the intermediate forms, so the, the compiled forms of Julia. And if one really wants to squeeze out performance, one can have a look at that generated code. Metaprogramming. Okay, let's get to GPU programming now. Just like Yongle told you about, you there are GPUs now from multiple hardware vendors. NVIDIA has been the dominant actor for many years, but there are now also very powerful AMD GPUs, including two uh, systems, two HPC systems on the top 500 list of the biggest supercomputers in the world. And there's also one uh, very powerful supercomputer now with Intel GPUs. And they all have these different frameworks to program them. In Julia, there are then now these uh, three main libraries, CUDA.jl, AMD GPU.jl, and one API.jl which, and well, also now Mactel.jl for the Apple GPUs. These are the libraries one uses to program GPUs for the, from the, these different vendors. And fortunately for us, they are all very similar. So the APIs, the functions, the names, the names of functions and so on, they're really similar. So you can translate in between them rather straightforwardly. Because I'm just running this notebook now on my laptop, I will need the Metal library for Apple GPUs. I've already installed it, so I don't need to run this cell. 
this is now how you might want to run something on a GPU. So in the case of MacDal JL, this is how I could define a new array that's living on the GPU. I, I explicitly define it on the GPU. And when I perform a calculation here, it's actually running on the GPU. There was a question already in the HackMD, what's the overhead in copying data? It's significant. So we should never be running simple calculations like this on the GPU. We need, the GPU need, really needs a lot of data in order to give a performance benefit. Here I want to tell you, uh, show you a more interesting example. We're defining uh, a matrix A, which is two by nine, uh, two to the power of nine. So 512 times 512. Uh, composed of single point, uh, single precision floating point ray A is on the CPU, and we copy it here to the GPU, just casting it like so. And I'm using a particular um, uh, way to to benchmark now, and I see that the first, the CPU version ran in 920 microseconds. The second one on the GPU ran in a little bit over uh, half the time. So it's not the dramatic speed speed up that Yonglei saw, but it's not bad for just an Apple GPU, which is not really meant for scientific calculations. So that's interesting. It's very convenient to work with this high level array interface to GPU programming. You can just define your arrays to be on the GPU like so and you can do a uh, matrix uh, multiplication, you can do vector addition, you can do all kinds of linear algebra, but all alg algorithms will not lend themselves to this higher level array interface. Sometimes you need to write your own kernel. Yonglei already showed you a little bit what kernels are. Basically, a kernel is just a function that somehow is launched on the GPU. And let's, let me just quickly show you how that works in Julia. This is basically a normal function. It's vector addition, summing two uh, vectors A and B into C. And now it runs on the CPU. I could in principle already uh, copy all these three arrays, A, B, C to the GPU uh, in the same way as before, and then launch the kernel now using this special macro at metal. This is just a way to launch it on the GPU. But this would indeed be a terrible idea. Why? Because if we look at the kernel now, it's a for loop looping over the, so to, from one to the length of this first vector. And each thread on the GPU will be running the exact same uh, calculation. But what we want to do is to split the compute over the different threads rather than having the GPU threads do the same thing. And I'm just quickly going to show you the logic behind it. And then I think I will leave over the word back to Yonglei. So you saw a picture similar to this on, on Yonglei's uh, slide. So these are all individual compute elements on the GPU. And one has to start thinking in terms of threads and blocks when you start looking into kernel programming. So threads are individual uh, GPU compute entities, which we want to assign unique work to. And one way to do that in, in Julia here, when it comes to the Metal JL framework, we, we use this function here. So thread position in grid is set into the variable index. So each uh, GPU thread will get a unique index. So when each thread computes this line here, they will be computing different parts of the uh, you know, of the vectors here. So this will now be more efficient. Okay, I think we'll, I will stop there. There's a lot more to say, but um, we simply don't have time. I encourage you to have a look at this notebook if you're interested. I just want to let you know that um, there's another section here for machine learning, if that's your cup of tea, uh, both traditional machine learning uh, and also deep learning. All right, so back to you, Yongli. You're, you're muted, Yongli. Yes, it's me again. I will talk what we have done. Uh, 
uh, you have the HackMD document, and here we provide the links for this document. The first one is the Jupyter Notebook for uh, presentations. You can come here for the three notebooks, GP Programming, Julia, and also Python. You can download and uh, play this code using your computer or if you have access to GPU. Second is our GitHub repositories. Uh, it contains all this information for these workshops we have organized, we have organized. Uh, it covers different aspects about uh, programming, CPU programming, GPU programming, HPC applications. And if you want to know more, you can come here at here. That's really, uh, I have provided two links here. ECC license using more mid format. ECC license let's using the man the map format. I will demonstrate using this one. Um, you can use the other one to see. These are all our lessons uh, organized in the graph chart. The root is our ECC license, and then we come to different categories. The first one we have the training instructor program. So if you are instructor and teaching some courses, we recommend you to come to this uh, uh, workshop or uh, repositories to see how can you interact with the uh, audience and participants of the course and of the workshop. Um, second is the basics of, of HPC programming. Um, and here, we, uh, some of us from our GitHub repositories, uh, some of us, we have the contribution to the others. For example, the Carpentries Incubator you can learn the introduction of HTTP programming at the introductory level. So a uh, huge part for the HTTP programming, uh, they have the CPU programming, GPU programming. Uh, if you, uh, we tell more about the GPU programming, uh, it covers different aspects. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have uh, several GPU programming models. Uh, it is the uh, 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 kernel based on a uh, portable Git kernel based on the non portable Git kernel based programming models. Everything is covered at our license right here. Um, like this one, GP programming, when, why, and how. If you click, you can come to the lesson materials right here. This is the one we organized. Uh, Go uh, goes through down the left uh, part, you see. Uh, high levels, introduction, directive based models, multiple GPU programming with MPI, with non portable and also portable and also private code to GPU. Um, this code, uh, not only for NVIDIA GPU, uh, GPU, but also for, it's also applicable for uh, AMD GPU. I think we have some examples for the Intel GPU. You can, you can go more details at this. Uh, uh, GitHub report. Uh, I get back right here. Yeah. Besides this, we have some others. For example, CUDA training, Open ACC, Open ACC for the GPU code, the general uh, CUDA C, uh, programming using SQL, and also GPU bootcamp um, right here. Um, these are somewhat low level since you should write the uh, code using CUDA C, CUDA C, and even CUDA Fortune. Uh, at the high level part, we have Python and Julia, we have talked uh, today. And the, even more, we have the HPC applications. We focus on three aspects for this DFT calculations to uh, get the electronic structure calculations. If you are working in academia, maybe you know about this. Uh, we use different packages, for example, WASP, EMTO, OpenMacAS. Uh, we collaborate with uh, uh, URCC, uh, yeah, URCC Center of Excellence. Uh, this one is uh, collaborate with the Max COE, focusing on the usage of well, Quantum Espresso, Yambo, DFT, and also Sista for to perform the DFT calculations. And we have also the Velocam from is developed by Professor NKGH for the Quantum Chemistry calculations, and also some others. The second is the molecular dynamic simulations. We may focus on using Gromax, uh, different aspects of Gromax to get the better GPU performance and also applications uh, of Gromax simulation use uh, focusing on the umbrella sampling uh, simulations. Uh, for the CFD part, we have open form training workshop, uh, training on uh, NECO 5000. I can mention that uh, the developer, the main developer, Nicholas, 
they have named the short, uh, shortlisted for the Golden Bell Prize, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, it's last year. And also we have some other workshop about the HPDA with high performance data analysis uh, for the climate model for, uh, with this uh, COE. This is COE is uh, supported by 10 countries and uh, multiple HPC centers focusing on the data, climate data and also prediction. Uh, besides this, we also have the quantum computing. Last year, last October, we organized uh, uh, a lot, uh, computing which is called the quantum autumn school we're focusing on the uh, quantum computing aspect and uh, this workshop is held was held in summers we saw the the quantum computer there and uh, we have lots of uh, lesson materials and also tutorials on the website another a big aspect is about the machine learning and the artificial intelligence we have introduction to machine learning uh, deep learning and the graph neural network and the transformers and they have several uh, uh, several ones about the AI up, upskilling AI training and also the webinars. And if you come to our YouTube channel, you can see the um, webinar information and uh, we organized it before. Um, yes, and also the programming tools uh, we also organized and also have contribution to this lesson materials together with Code Refinery and also others. Uh, software carpentries focusing on Unix shell, uh, research software development, uh, testing, and also the version control using Git, and also uh, that's a modular code development, introduction to containers. Besides this, I can mention that ECSS provide other services. For example, if you work uh, in academia or industry, you want to use HPC, you can come to us and we provide uh, we, we will show you how to access for the application to access to the G HPC GU systems. Currently, we can access to multiple machines in, in, uh, in Europe. For example, Lumi in Finland, uh, Leonardo Booster in Italy, well, and uh, others in, in other European countries. And uh, we also have the Prof of, Prof of Concept Development Project. So, we can provide the support if you want to use the uh, uh, HPC for your uh, program and uh, all this. Yeah, this is all the um, ECC lessons. I uh, you can uh, some of them you can uh, we can provide the link and you can directly come to this uh, HackMD document to check in more details. Yes, I'm done. I'm done. All right. <clears throat> Well, this is the end of the hour then. Thank you very much, Yongli and Thor. This was a very informative session. There are many questions in a HackMD document and you already answered that, that's great. So we will be sending a link to the recording as well as the HackMD document. And you know, you're still welcome to add questions and Yongli and Thor will answer them. All right, thank you very much then. We're gonna send the, the uh, sorry, the questionnaire as well, the feedback. Yes, and then they will everyone will receive a uh, an email uh, in three minutes asking to give us some feedback about today. Yeah, you, you can mention we have more webinars in the following days. Yes.